Hello all, thanks for being here. My name is Tara Pham. I am the founder and CEO of a company called CTY. We make a sensor system that collects real-time insights from streets for planners and cities. Uh, and that is called Numina. And I get to moderate this lovely panel this morning. So um, I will just, why don't we all just come up? Because I think we're all going to just introduce ourselves. Um, but I am joined by Tom D'Alessio, um, who's the president, CEO, and publisher of Next City. Uh, Rasmia, well, here I'll go in order here. Anthony Venke, who's at MIT. Rasmia Kermani Fry, who's the director of the Office of Public Private Partnerships for the New York Housing Authority, and Oliver Shaper from Gensler. Um, so maybe. Uh, just to get a little bit more into the self-introduction, uh, we can go down the line and all say what we are doing to innovate in cities and why we might be on this panel. So we'll start with you, Tom. So as Tara said, I'm the president, CEO, and publisher of Next City. We're an online publication. Um, we also produce events all about social, economic, and environmental change in cities. So if you haven't uh, seen us yet, it's nextcity.org. I encourage everybody to go on their phone right now Book it, check it out. Um, we produce daily content. Um, and we have an event called Vanguard for urban leaders under 40. And Tara was one of our vanguards in this year's program. Next year, we'll be in Montreal. So uh, check it out, especially if you're under 40. It's the greatest club I'll never be able to join. <laughs> Maybe I'll start asking for an invitation now and you know, sweet talk to you later. Uh, hi, I'm Anthony Vanke. I, until very recently, was the partner strategist for the MIT Sensible City Lab, which looks at the interface of digital technology and the digital data that we're now producing and using that to propose uh, new opportunities for cities, um, working with uh, companies, of course, MIT as an academic um, entity, uh, and then private companies as well, and how we actually can bring all those different assets together to create living laboratories in cities to really see how technology is going to change the way we live. Um, and I'm here because obviously when you think innovation in cities, you think public housing. I think that's just obvious. Um, I'm kidding. Um, so my name is Rasmia, or Raz, and yes, I'm the director of the Office of Public-Private Partnerships at the New York City Housing Authority. But more importantly to this conversation, I'm the founding president of the Fund for Public Housing, um, which is basically NYCHA's innovation escape hatch. Um, a place to think about innovation and public housing. And I've been at the Housing Authority for a little over a year, but, and prior to that, spent 20 years in New York City as a community organizer and executive director of community-based organizations, most recently 10 years in Brownsville, Brooklyn. Um, and the reason, though, I decided to come to public housing is because, um, you know, the New York City Housing Authority is bigger than the city of Atlanta. It's bigger than the city of Miami. It's the largest landlord in North America. It is part of New York City. I think people and New Yorkers really do understand the significance and the relevance of other systems with the word public in front of it and feel connected to other systems with the word public in front of it, public education, public parks, and not public housing. Um, and the people who live in public housing make all of those other systems run, and it is time to kind of connect and realize that we're part of one city and that innovation can, can benefit from residents of public housing and can benefit public housing and it will only make the city stronger. Well said. Uh, good morning, my name is Oliver Schopper. I direct uh, planning and urban design for Gensler. Uh, Gensler is a global design organization. We have 46 offices across the globe. Um, and uh, we do everything from designing labels for wine bottles to large cities in various parts of the world. Um, I'm an architect by training. Um, uh, during my career, I've done uh, all kinds of things, worked on all kinds of scales. Um, uh, urban design uh, is my passion. Um, in this function, I get to get involved with projects that are either, you know, cities from scratch, something that we didn't think possible and, and, you know, people still have doubts that that's a possibility, but cities from scratch in the Middle East and China uh, in other parts of the world, uh, down to um, infill projects in Istanbul, in, uh, in Guatemala City, in, in again, uh, Latin America. Um, 
and also here in uh, New York City, and uh, we do significant work in Brooklyn um, and in the Bronx. And uh, it's been uh, in, in very, very interesting uh, kind of activity because um, the local work that we've uh, started doing beginning of this year with uh, Economic Development Corporation uh, is uh, working for a public client, which uh, when, uh, when you talk about starting cities from scratch, you're usually not doing it for a public client. Um, so uh, what's interesting about this activity in general and um, the idea that uh, uh, urbanism and uh, how we design our cities or how we influence the performance and the appearance and the authenticity of our cities, why this is such a hot topic is that we're moving into this era of um, you know, more than 50% of the world's population living in urban environments and uh, the fact that the, the securing livelihood for the world's population will uh, uh, will be determined uh, within urban environments. And uh, I'll elaborate on that further, but uh, it's great to be here this morning. Cool, thank you all. Um, so first I wanted just to say that uh, I think this panel is interesting because we get a little bit of a holistic view of the future of cities. There was another Future of Cities panel yesterday that had a little bit more of a sort of tactical, even material science view of it. And so um, I know that my interest is sort of how we make cities equitably. And um, to me, that's what a future city looks like, is one that's equitable. Um, and that also changes how we innovate in cities. So I'm wondering if we can all go down the line and say, and also feel free to respond to each other in the process. but. Um, say what you think a future city looks like and maybe one or two specific things that you are doing to kind of get us there in your work. Want to start all over? Sure, start. The other um, okay, that's, uh, um, that's a super general and very wide question, so I'll, I'll pick just a few things. Um, uh, we see in what drives the urban debate uh, in this country and globally, uh, some of those drivers seems to be changing every 10 years. And uh, we went through a period where it was all about sustainability and um, uh, then especially in New York City, Irene and Sandy hit and now it's all about resilience. And the larger narrative here is that um, uh, you know, sustainability focused on um, preventing climate change with all its negative effects and resilience uh, now says uh, we can't prevent it. Uh, how do we deal with the consequences and how do we uh, create cities that um, uh, withstand that um, and evolve stronger going through a traumatic experience, which is the core definition of being resilient or a resilient city. Now, I think... Um, one thing that we discovered along the way, and this touches on the aspect of future cities, is that of community building. And um, I think uh, if there's one single thing uh, that's super important, it's that about community building and uh, creating a sense of belonging and creating instruments that um, uh, enable community to build the cities uh, that they live in uh, themselves. And as planners and designers, uh, almost be the moderators or, or the facilitators uh, of that process. And uh, what that means is that interventions that we undertake are usually sort of catalytic in nature. And um, we don't design cities, we design with cities because our actual activity is minuscule compared to all the forces and the dynamics and the, um, uh, the ideas uh, that exist within the complex system of a city and that uh, need to be recognized and harnessed. And I think uh, we also um, are moving into a time where those, um, uh, you know, where, where our capability of understanding the city as a complex system is growing and technology plays a huge part in that. Um, but I also think that the technology side of it needs to be balanced with the fact that um, uh, cities are ultimately built for people and uh, for people that not, and we talked about this previously, uh, or just before this, they're, they're not, people are not, trained and equipped uh, to participate from a technical point of view, but they come with strong opinions, and of course it's their lives that are at stake. So uh, uh, those kind of components, when they brought together in a successful way, I think that's a future model. Um, there are um, one other aspect, and this is this, um, this whole idea whether or not uh, cities as man-made artificial 
artifacts um, actually have a future in a, in a planet that is degrading, environmentally degrading more and more. Um, and I think that uh, that's, a, that's a, almost a separate but related issue where uh, the right balance of what we call carrying capacity, meaning the, the ability of a certain space to support livelihoods for the people that live within that space, um, that um, those are, those are, that's a threshold that uh, is extremely interesting for us to observe when it comes to um, future densities, um, uh, infrastructure systems for cities, um, anything that has to do with supporting services uh, that are, again, incredibly complex in nature. But, um, you know, I think those three things would be on the forefront. Um, if I can build off of that, um, I think, and this we said this in the back a little bit before we got up here, you know, rarely do communities need to be created. They already exist. And it's the people who live in those communities who can better than anyone, um, define what the problems are and have been asked to define and redefine the problems a million and one times. Um, but they can also define and articulate what the solutions are. Um, and often what is lacking is like the connective tissue to make those solutions kind of come forth. So I think that there's, on the one hand, there's not a lot that's new and this gets to the equity issue. Equity is, is really understanding that communities don't need to be created, they have existed and so have the solutions to whatever is going on in those communities. I think also in terms of innovation, and I'll obviously speak from a public housing perspective, you know, public housing as a system has never been invited in um, or asked to really be part of the innovation conversation. And um, one of the innovative things in New York City is actually that New York City is kind of bucking the national trend, which is to take down public housing because the, there is no like federal funding ferry that's gonna come and save public housing. Um, you know, the New York City Housing Authority has a $17.1 billion capital budget gap. And that is due to a lot of things. And one of the big things is the decrease in federal investment in public housing, and that our buildings are about at the average age of 50 years, and there are a lot of roofs that need to be replaced. Um, so there are regular things that need to change to make public housing more sustainable. And then um, I think the question of how can then public housing be connected to innovative urban practices and residents be contribute to those conversations um, is that is how you then create equity and how you decrease fear and fear uh, that is realistically based in um, the fact that decisions have been made without the inclusion of resident voices. So how do you change that? And, and then on the, like, on the system side, um, I think for a long time the housing authority was kind of like a, a like lanky, awkward teenager, right? Like, oh my God, we're so big, we're so awkward. Like maybe if nobody looks at us, then we don't have to look at anybody else. And I think <laughs> that the city, the rest of the city too, was like, oh my God, we see all those big buildings. Maybe if we don't interact with that, we, then they, people won't interact with us. And that's got to change. Um, one uh, uh, operational example that I'll give is, because there's huge opportunity to innovate um, with public housing and with residents of public housing. You know, I asked, um, so because I think I'm a, I talk to everyone all the time, like bar to boardroom about public housing, um, organizing my fellow executives to that, it, that innovation is good and they totally get it asking our senior vice president of operations, like what are all of the operational issues that you can't solve? And that would change the quality of life for residents of public housing. So asking residents too, and I have this enormous list of things from like widget to system. And that is a perfect opportunity to, for, the public, for the housing authority to become external. And that, understanding that has absolutely 
um, led to decisions I've made to build the board for the Fund for Public Housing. So it was really important to me that there was a tech person on the board. Um, the, the guy who's on the board who's a total techie and like hug, huggy, he's great, um, Scott Anderson from Intersection. Um, like because tech people solve problems differently than bureaucrats, right? You try things, you try again. And that has led to um, we, the Fund for Public Housing, with NYCHA and the tech community and residents, are going to be um, creating a competition, a tech competition to solve NYCHA operational issues. And, you know, New York City has done tech competitions before with EDC, with DCAS. NYCHA's never done anything like this. And so I think in terms of equity and inclusiveness and innovation, you have to think about how you are going to do business differently from top to bottom. Funding, operating, engaging, and rebuilding. For us at MIT and you know the laboratory I'm in, it's a little different because we don't have a necessary return on investment, you know, thing. You know, our job I think is to ask questions. That's the, the intent of research. And I think when research does it right, you know, equity may not be the goal, but it should damn hell be, you know, kind of embedded in that conversation. Because ultimately, we're serving people, we're serving society. You know, and I think as a, a value of ours too, being in a Department of Urban Studies and Planning, it's not necessarily top down. You know, and I think for us as our research MO, in asking those questions, what we're doing is making infrastructure and life transparent. Obviously, we take a slice by looking at technology and data, but it's about making things that we'd never realized you know, apparent, visible to us. You know, some people are doing self-driving vehicles. You know, I'm not so interested in that, you know, but for me, one of the projects that I think really stands out for us is in the early days of the Internet of Things, which, you know, everyone is talking about now. It's like another buzz thing, you know. Sustainability went out as the buzz and smart cities came in as the buzz and now Internet of Things. Everything is about the Internet of Things. Everything will talk back. For us, we were asking, does anyone care you know, if this chair talks back to me, like, okay, maybe I can learn about the structural loads of the building if that concrete beam talks back, but, you know, I really don't care. And one of the questions we asked was, well, can we actually make people care about the thing they care the least about, which is a thing you throw away? Um, and it's actually amazing. I challenge anyone to actually tell me where that paper cup will end up. I mean, I actually know where it'll end up. But we actually put sensors in that. And the amazing thing is, is that we actually were able to draw a map. We did, a, we did a small one in New York. The story's better with Seattle because they do um, incineration for power. They have local recycling and everything. But by actually following this little cup or at the scale of 3,000 objects, the amazing thing is, is that some things are working well, you know, as expected. Things are going to, you know, generating power. Some things are getting recycled. Some things are going to compost. But some things weren't. Some things were traveling across the country. Literally, things were traveling to Atlanta, to Florida, to New York, which was very peculiar. What we were finding was that all these new things that we've produced in life, you know, the new devices, the new technologies, even your toner cartridges, are taking very weird trajectories around the world because we don't know how to deal with them. Now, the cost of that is we're finding where they end up. We know we've seen pictures of things going overseas. We've actually been able to trace. It's pending litigation now. But uh, we've actually been able to trace the illegal electronics trade overseas. You know, actually finding things, because technically, we're not allowed to send you know, CRT monitors to China. Well, those companies didn't. They sent them to Vietnam, who then people from Vietnam were walking them over the border into China. And then from China, they were traveling to Hong Kong, and then where they ultimately stopped communicating was in Taipei. And you can ask, like, what, what the hell is going on you know, with this? But I think by allowing that, that, that transparency to come through, we can begin to ask very difficult questions about society. You know? And one of the, the, the kind of fallouts was Dell was working with a, a company to do electronics recycling. They thought they were doing everything great. You know, they, they were throwing all this money. And yet, it's ending up with children pulling electronics apart. You know, th that becomes scary. And you know, even domestically, one of, one of the things we're doing now in Boston is we're putting probes into the sewers to measure the DNA load you know, of the community. Now, on one side, we could be like, OK, let's look at Ebola. But really, you know, like all the stuff that happened with Ebola, what, six cases in the United States? The bigger issue is that 30 million Americans have diabetes. Of that. It's estimated by the CDC that 9 million people don't even know they have it. 
Think of the costs for those families, the costs for society, the communities. But if we can actually begin to understand some of these things in ways that protect also privacy, could we actually provide the services back to people, recognizing that the federal government ferry is not coming around, but could we actually be smarter in the way we allocate some of these resources by making these invisible structures more transparent? And I think the bigger transformation is that by working with cities, in the case of the latter project with the city of Cambridge, I mean, it's a small city, you know. I think Brooklyn has twice the population of Cambridge or something like that. Queens probably has like three times or whatever, you know, we're small, but how does government actually engage with research? You know, how does a city be a living laboratory? The model has been, you know, with like data now, it's a one-way street. They put up an API. It's kind of like your iPhone. You know, Apple will send data to some of the apps that you can't talk back to the Apple system. Now they're starting to change it. Could we actually, like some of these, you know, the innovation kind of processes that you're talking about, actually evolve the way cities operate to actually be able to pull some of that information in, not just tra transform the processes, but also transform the operations as well by taking some of these great ideas and actually being able to see what those can do ultimately in the real world. So in the interest of full disclosure, I actually remember the 1964 World's Fair. <laughs> it's four years old. Um, I also remember Yogi Berra, and Yogi Berra once said, you know, you can learn, you can see a lot by looking. And so a lot of what we do is we look at what's happening, the changes that are happening in cities all around. And so I've long had that vision of future land in my mind of what the city of the future should be and going through. Um, but the job that I have is wonderful because it gives me the chance to travel around the world and see what's actually happening. And so if actually you go online at nextcity.org, you can see my latest post on uh, Chicago in the Pullman district. And so in the late 1800s, um, George Pullman built this brand new community that was built on a lot of the sustainability and resiliency um, uh, principles that we have today. It fell into disrepair, and local community is actually coming back to restore that area. And we can actually learn from those lessons. Uh, Method, if you use some of those cleaning products, built a brand new facility there. Um, they leased out their roof for the largest um, rooftop garden in the world. It's growing you know, leafy greens and others, that's selling products to the places in, in Chicago that are food deserts. So we're seeing a lot of the things that we've, used, we've had for a long time happening in Ben. What I did see that I hadn't seen before was in Dubai in February at the World Government Summit. And Dubai is going to have the World's Fair in 2020. Um, but what was fascinating is they're starting to contemplate and actually are going to build a museum of the future. And they're starting to think about what that museum would be like and what will be in it. And a lot of what I saw downstairs are the ideas that will be in the museum of the future. A couple of ideas I didn't see downstairs that I find a little frightening are the idea of implanting chips in your brain or in your body to actually sense what you're doing um, to, to help gauge your health. Um, also to be able to sense what other people are doing. I'm not too sure if people are willing to go that far going through. I'm more of the you know, RAS side of basically making sure we're more engaged with the community, actually talking to people, what a radical thought, rather than in texting or using you know, sensors going through, um, actually engaging people in the conversations. And it's places like the Pullman District, um, it's places like uh, you know, Chelsea, it's places around the world that had this throughout its history that we need to find. And yes, as Anthony's right, you know, the federal government ferry is not coming around. But through public-private partnerships and engaging folks, we can have the best. The key, though, is to look to what Tara has just uh, indicated. If we don't have an equity lens in all of this conversation, we're likely to lose the best of our society, and we're more likely to become a monoculture. And history has proven and science has proven that monocultures don't survive. So it's in all of our interest to actually ensure that we have this equity focus. Great. So, Raz, I wanted to ask, you, you mentioned that the Housing Authority has typically, not, has typically been excluded from the innovation conversation. I'm curious why you think that is. I think, it's, uh, it's, I think it comes down to connectedness and on both sides. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, the housing, New York City Housing Authority, I can't speak to any other housing authority, you know, it's freaking huge. Like, it's 12,000 people is the workforce, a third of whom are public housing residents, make up a third of the workforce of the housing authority. Um, it's 180,000 units, it's half a million people, and it's also, I think, been um, 
insular. So it is that like duality of both not being invited to the party and also not crashing the party. Um, and that and kind of staying that way. So um, innovation, I, I think as a concept, is not new. Like urban innovation isn't new. We've, our cities have been innovating since forever, right? The first settlement house that started in New York over 100 years ago, that was an innovation to see how that, that model could work. Um, churches as safe havens, that's an innovation. So, but I think for um, the Housing Authority, there has been a history of, well, that's the way we've always done it. Um, and there are lots and lots and lots of rules from HUD, um, the federal parent, Housing and Urban Development, that um, like support that, right? This is the way you have to do it. Um, everything from procurement rules, which I, it's such a sexy topic, but I, I won't go into it now. But there are lots of, it's the big one, there are lots of out-of-the-box policies from the federal government that don't fit a huge housing authority like New York's, um, which is larger than the next nine housing authorities added up together. Um, and so, and I don't think that we, and the changing population of the housing authority, I think is something that makes people uncomfortable to talk about, but you gotta talk about race and poverty and like who gets excluded from the innovation conversation. So whose ideas um, are considered innovative and who gets listened to and who gets funded? And I think that's part, of the, that's part of the issue. So it both has to be the willingness of the housing authority, and I, we're, we are there. This is the reason I came to the housing authority is because the leadership is willing and knows that it's public-private partnerships and relationships and being open to that that is going to um, like create a sustainable public housing environment. It's the only way. It's the only way. If any other uh, business had lost a billion dollars over the last 10 years, they would go bankrupt. We can't go bankrupt. Like, where will people live? Honestly, where will the people who live, who work for the systems that make this city run, live? So I think that there is a willingness on the housing authority side to say, listen, we can't solve this by ourselves. And it's, and I use this analogy in a lot of my work, and then you have to begin dating. You have to begin figuring out how to have relationships differently with external folks. And that dating is like dating, right? Like, I mean, it, it fully is. Um, and so some of the dating is super slow and like meet the parents and like be really slow. And then some of the dating is like, oh my God, you're hot, I'm hot, let's do it. And you have to be prepared to have all of those relationships. And I think it's the willingness of the housing authority to be open to that and then the willingness of the city to say, yes, we see the value of public housing and then for the residents to feel included so that the fear of innovation and change is mitigated because people are involved. I'm seeing some intense nods from you. <laughs> Do you have it? Well, you know, like for me, I agree because I think that it, the hardest part is sometimes just getting in the room. And if you don't know that, you know, you know, that date was scheduled. Like, how do you end up, you know, dressed well? And I think the hard part, yeah, I mean, yeah. sorry, that was probably not the best. Uh, because, I, you know, one of the challenges for me is also thinking about, you know, the, there's a lot of discussions right now because of the politics that we're seeing and everything. And, you know, it looks like, you know, the big dogs. You know, Google and Apple always come up as names. But the challenge sometimes too is how do the smaller players come in? And I think, especially with the equity question, we were having this conversation over there, how do you get the multi multiplicity of voices? You know, both the squeakiest wheels, but also that person who's maybe, you know, in a community meeting in the back who's not as vocal, but is thinking and maybe has been to a lot of meetings and has a lot of ideas. And I think that's like one of the, the continual challenges of, you know, how do you make sure that the housing authority, you know, is in the room and how do you get other players who have great ideas into those meetings that you're holding as well? And I think that's one of those great challenges. You know, it's like organizational theory. Since organizational theory has become a thing, you know, whatever, 150 years ago, it's always been a challenge of how do you get all the best voices, all of them. And, I, and for me, that's always a challenge. Because even for us, you know, 
the work I do, my research, my research groups, you know, all the people I work with, we're lucky because we have, you know, three letters behind us that's fairly well known. But it doesn't mean that we have the best ideas. Right? You know, look at a lot of the new, you know, innovations. They're not coming from the U.S. A lot of them are coming out of need around the world. But we have access because I have the letters MIT behind it. And, you know, for me, the question and the nodding is also how do we get all of those voices into the room to think about ur urban innovation systemically to, you know, infrastructure to kind of the everyday solutions that we may need. Well, this is an interesting thing about innovation in cities in particular. So I am in a tech company, small tech company, a two-person tech company um, that's trying to innovate in cities. And while, yes, we are making new technologies, the it's not like a tech startup is a new thing. The new thing is, for us at least, the challenge is actually implementing in cities because like, normally you build a product or you have a startup and you're selling to early adopters and usually that's the person who's willing to pay for it up front. Um, and typically that means you know a more affluent person or someone who just so feels your pain point. Um, but in cities, you don't get to just pick and choose who your customer is. Everyone is your customer. You have to serve everyone. And so you know, what we've found is the actual challenge of implementation. And some of that is like proving the ROI of this intervention. So my next question is, you know, what are your metrics individually for success and what do you consider the ROI of, a, of your projects or of a good civic innovation? Well, the first thing, I think it's critical to make sure that there's transparency going through. Uh, the second is to make sure there's leadership and the third is to make sure that there's an opportunity to fail. And in government, that's a very, very risky business. So the challenge to all of you is to make sure that you give your elected and appointed officials the space to fail. And the okay to say, you're young enough that it, you know, if you fail today, you still have tomorrow. Um, we have this culture today that's very, very challenging because um, older folks are controlling a lot of what's happening. Most of the legislators that are out there are probably twice your age, and they don't know the experience you're dealing with. Um, they're leaving you with a hell of a lot of debt. And so that's why I think that's your license, at the very least, to challenge them to say, we're allowing you to fail, to go through, to allow people like Tara and Anthony and others to actually go out there and make things work. Um, if we don't get past that Rubicon, I think that's our major, major challenge. Yeah, I think, you know, just to, to comment on your, your point for just a second, uh, I think that's actually one of the big things. That's why I was saying your procurement is not sexy, but it's such a big deal because of all of the bureaucracy. You know, and they came with good, well, maybe at one time, good intentions for transparency. You don't want the person who's, you know, paying under the table to get access, but you want to make sure that you're actually giving other people opportunities to be able to do that. And just the bureaucracy around procurement. You know, you could be a republic, a staunch libertarian, you know, conservative on one side, and agree that that has to change. You have to be, you can be a liberal and agree that there needs to be change. So why don't we just do it? You know, but it is, it's incredibly difficult. But I think that for cities to really be innovative from the top down, they have to rethink this among many other infrastructures, but really rethink what is it that you want you know, and how do we make sure that you're not going to blow a billion dollars on, you know, a system that doesn't work? I mean, for us, I mean, actually, it's related to kind of our metrics. You know, I, I often joke that um, our sisters uh, within our academic school at MIT, the Media Lab, when a professor goes up for tenure, the only metric that they have is world fame. Uh, <laughs> to quote, actually, you know, uh, John Maida, um, but you know, for us, it's not quite world fame. But I think for us, it's it's three measures. I think one is that we can get really great academic outputs if we can get in top tier journals, which I don't know, two thirds of this room doesn't care about. You know, uh, you know, it's an academic thing. How do we you know kind of fulfill the metrics of academia? I think another one is you know coming up with really great ideas that have the potential to become a, a spin out, to become new companies. You know, to become great ideas that actually can change you know, the built environment. And the third one is, how do we change the conversation? How do we make something also public? Because for every journal paper that we publish in you know, a journal, like, I mean, we publish that, no one's ever gonna look at it. It's gonna collect us. We can work with a city, with a mayor, and they're never gonna look at it. The way to actually implement change or have change happen is to change the conversation with the public. You know, one of our projects um, that we did in New York, we were looking at the taxis, you know, and we asked a simple question. 
what if people in New York shared a taxi? We, we did this mathematical analysis with you know, 130, no, 170 million trips, 340 million pick up and drop offs, so the GPS and everything. <laughs> we found that if you were willing to share a ride and were willing to extend your trip by two minutes, either on the front end or the back end, you can reduce the number of taxi rides in New York by 40%. You can take 40% of the taxis off the road or they could work 40% less and make the same amount of money and actually spend time with their families. That's, that's powerful. The paper you know, got published in a top tier journal. No one ever really looked at it. I mean, mathematicians did. But we created a, yeah, but you know. I don't know, if, sorry, I, I'm gonna make fun of a lot of people. If you're a mathematician, you're great. I wish I had those skill sets. Um, but we, uh, we created a website you know, to make it public where it's interactive. You can pick any two points in the city of New York, see the number of trips between those two points, and then in real time calculate if people shared between those two points how much money you could save. So just go from Penn Station to Columbus Circle, just between those two points. If you uh, shared your rides, I forgot the exact number, but something like $4 million in fares could have been saved, just between those two points. Um, so then all of a sudden, the MTA is talking to us because they saw that. The New York Times covered it. We changed the discussion, and of course, a small San Francisco-based company that has an application that some of you may have used uh, may know of a, an offering that they have that you know, is very similar to this research that we looked at, um, not to mention any names. Uh, but, you know, but I think because of that, that public-facing side really changes the conversation. And then we can ask, okay, Michael Bloomberg early in his term thought about road congestion pricing with you know, great ambitions of why, but maybe we can maybe not so heavy-handed, get really kind of great outcomes by rethinking that infrastructure while still preserving the welfare of really hard-working people in the city. You know, and I think that those are our metrics of how do you begin to change that conversation but also have impact academically, but also in the real world. Um, I think to the point that you've got to let government try things and that it's incredibly important. Um, and to metrics in general, and I say this to myself and my team and everyone, like if you don't know what to measure, like just start measuring something. <laughs> just start and so you can practice measuring things um, and then change it. And, um, and I think that, that, that it's it is funny, it's really true, um, and it's an important conversation to have with funders, whether they're philanthropic, whether they're VC, whoever. That I used to say in the nonprofit world to um, my funders, who I loved, um, that they would often ask me to measure things that I knew weren't important. So I would keep two, two sets of books, and I would tell them, listen, I'm happy to report on what you asked me to measure. And then if you want to actually hear about what's important, I can report on those things too. Um, and let's, or if I started measuring something and it took a turn and was like, oh man, yeah, no, why are we measuring that? Like pick up the phone and tell someone. Um, I, so I think like in the, in the transparency vein, it's like nothing should, not nothing, it's too extreme. Most things shouldn't be a surprise. If you notice that you're measuring something and that's not the right thing to measure, it's okay to measure something else. Like, talk about it. That's a finding. That's important um, to the conversation. Um, and uh, in terms of ROI, I think about this a lot. I've, uh, I used to have such a hard time with return on investment and poverty and, like, I don't, um, I, people not being poor. That would be a good uh, return on an investment. Um, <laughs> And I, and I mean that sincerely. So like how, you know, for the New York City Housing Authority, um, which is different than the Fund for Public Housing, but for the New York City Housing Authority, I do think that the return on investment of doing business differently is our community safer, cleaner, and more connected to each other. And then how do you come up with those metrics? And I'm happy to talk about that offline. There are like 9 million of them and we are tracking that. And then it is also about those four big buckets I talked about, which is funding. So are you funding differently and what does that look like and can you measure that? Are you operating differently? So um, what does modern property management look like in New York City? It often doesn't look like the New York City Housing Authority. So how, what can we learn from modern property management and then implement? Um, rebuild, that is a really scary one for people. How, how do we create a revenue generation without immediately having people saying, oh, you're selling off um, 
Housing Authority land. That is, in fact, 100% untrue. And believe me, I was of the, oh, yes, they are, before I got there and was like, oh, my God, no, they're not. Um, so I think part of the measurement, a really important measurement for the New York City Housing Authority is more efficient and effective communication and engagement and measuring that. How are we measuring that? And I think that's measured by like customer satisfaction. It is residents' well-being and our resi do residents feel part of the conversation. On the fund for public housing side, um, we are, and by we I mostly mean like me to myself, um, and my board have this conversation all the time. You know, we got our 501c3 designation from the IRS in January. So this has been it, what's exciting to me is that is that measure anything. Um, just start measuring. So for me, it's measuring like what are the new relationships? How do you measure effective partnership? How do you measure and define innovation um, within a public housing sector that actually is important to residents and then changes those four big bucket areas? So um, it's a constant conversation. Uh, for us, the, um, we like the idea of return on investment because it gives you a black and white statement whether or not uh, your plan was a success or not. Um, but this is where it already stops to be that easy. Um, and especially in the planning urban design world, um, there are several obstacles to do it this way. One is um, uh, nine out of ten plans that we make never are never implemented. Uh, a lot of the things are, um, you know, scenarios that help uh, in a decision-making process but are never intended to become a plan for implementation. Uh, if the one in ten uh, actually gets uh, implemented, uh, it probably takes 20 years uh, from, from beginning to end. Um, so unlike in the world of buildings where you can measure uh, the energy performance of a building or increased productivity of office workers or uh, or reduced operating costs compared to base case, et cetera. Uh, in the urban planning world, it's, it's extremely difficult, but it also means that um, our success or our measuring of return on investment is really in what you heard uh, before in terms of observing the process of how a plan is being received and being involved in the process of explaining and facilitating. Uh, because you see reactions, you hear um, you, you set a different context, you, you, you have influence on the public debate, uh, you um, feel if what you propose um, fulfills a need or, or hits the right point that it needs to hit, uh, and those are measures of success in, in, in our opinion. Um, yeah. So I heard a couple things that resonated with me personally, which are like, if we could humanize bureaucrats, I think we'd actually be able to do a lot more with the government. Like, I also have had the experience of being a citizen and being frustrated and then actually working within an office in civic uh, city hall and realizing, like, oh, people are actually doing all the right things and really well-intended. It's just, you know... Um, sometimes the system is working against us all. <laughs> Inertia is hard, yeah. you know. <laughs> You know, it's hard enough to turn a battleship with that metaphor, but a city is however many million times bigger than a battleship, you know. And, there, and you know, everyone, you know, you wouldn't be working, you know, in these positions for not a lot of money, to be frank, if you didn't at least care and have optimism. But, it, you know, there's just a lot of inertia. Yeah, but I also think um, it really depends on the people that uh, are in those leadership positions. Um, because if you look at the big success stories like Curitiba in Brazil, for example, or Bogota, the, the, the remaking of the public transportation system. Uh, those are stories that uh, happen in environments of inertia, but they were in charismatic individuals with the real gift of uh, conviction and getting people on board, um, and a certain healthy dose of, like, let's, let's just go for it and not think we fail and not do it because we think we fail, and then you see success. Um, so it's a, it's a balance between um, sort of the sweet spot of, of the right policy coming together with the right leadership and, uh, and, and the right kind of creative um, rethinking of things that really need to change that uh, I think can make a difference in the world. And I think also the, then the 
especially, well, everywhere, but recognizing that the citizenry is not monolithic. So there is not one way to engage. There is not one way to have that conversation. And there, just like there's not one way to innovate. And when I say, so being willing to have different processes for different people um, who are open to having different kinds of conversations, it's messy and complicated, but there is no kind of silver bullet of anything that's going to work for everyone. And, um, and I think that is incredibly important, um, as well as, you know, the political cycles make things really difficult, too. So new leaders come in with new ideas, and it's like, but wait, we were just doing that. Like, can we finish doing that? I think that's really hard. Um, and this is going to sound maybe bananas, but also... At, having everyone be patient and open. So do you really want change, really? Because that's actually going to require you to change. And so people like change as long as they don't actually have to change um, <laughs> often, right? Or change what, oh, yeah, I want everything to change except not that one thing that I like so much. But that one thing might, you might have to change that. So being open, and that's why those non-monolithic engagement methods are so important um, um, to, the, to the process. Um, yeah, I'm saying um a lot. <laughs> and and change happens when the fear of change is less than the fear of the known. I mean, the fear of unknown is actually more acceptable. And if you believe demography is destiny, we're in a really sweet spot right now because all the trends are moving towards cities, as was mentioned before. For the first time in human history, over 54% of people around the world live in cities, expected to go to 70 to 80% by 2050. Um, not only socialization, because baby boomers, millennials, and immigrants are all moving to cities, but also corporations, as we're seeing here, small businesses. Um, there's an economic incentive to be in cities. And then last but not least, there's an environmental reason to be in cities. And last but not least, when you look at the whole fact of demography, and if you believe demography is destiny, um, baby boomers are starting to retire. And there are going to be a lot of opportunities in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors mm -hmm. for millennials, for younger people to step up to the plate and to say that we need the change because we can't continue to live in a suburban 1980s mentality. We've got a brand new world, and we've got to figure out how to live in it. But I think, I think the two challenges to that are, one, I think to reinforce your point about not being afraid, I think Singapore is, for me, a really interesting case. They are probably the quote-unquote smartest city on the planet because as part of their national development plan for 30 years, they found the best practices anywhere in the world and implemented it. And a few years ago, you know, and you could talk to some of the people you know, in different authorities, they hit this weird point where they looked at themselves and said, shoot, we are the best practice. What's next? And now everyone is terrified about doing anything new because now it comes with risk. It was great that you know, London tested road congestion pricing. Oh, it worked there? We can implement it and we'll make it better. But now what's next? And, and I think that, that fear of change is actually really difficult to get over. And I think the other side too is that with the movement towards urbanization, it's how do we also make sure that we do it together? You know, because you see actually in a lot of cities, Phoenix, Detroit, there's movement towards the center cities but now you're starting to have these weird donuts that are forming where it's empty. Detroit obviously has bigger issues, but those inner suburbs are beginning to become question marks. And then what do we do with all of those? You know, that became the model of urbanization for better or for worse, depending on your viewpoint. I have my own views. Um, for, you know, half a century. Now what do we do with a lot of land, a lot of houses, a lot of infrastructure um, that doesn't, that has an uncertain future at this point. And we don't know, you know, New York, you know, is a, a great city, but it is not kind of, you know, it is unique among the American cities. And unfortunately, in a lot of the world, there are a lot of Houstons and there are a lot of New Yorks. Uh, and I think even within New York, there are Houstons. So um, there, you know, it. I often used to, when I was in Brownsville, used to describe Brownsville, Brooklyn. Has anybody heard of Brownsville, Brooklyn? Or been, okay. Um, it used to be that no hands would go up. And I would <laughs> describe Brownsville to people over the phone as urban rural. Right? It's urban in its density, but rural in its disconnectedness. And I think that 
that happens in New York City. Right. And the, um, you know, we were talking about er earlier that tactical urbanism creating change and new ideas. There are kind of short, medium, and long term changes that could reduce that that urban ruralness, but also preserve pieces of that ruralness that communities yeah. want. So. Harry, you can talk a bit about Houston, having been there at Vanguard, yeah. but one of the most amazing <laughs> things that we had, because we just had our Vanguard in Houston, um, every year there's 5,000 new apartments um, being opened in downtown Houston. So it's a city that's sprawling and densifying at the same time, and we're learning lessons from places like yeah. Houston. Um, it gets to that question of what is a city, and it's a very, very, especially for next city, a very tack a challenge to, to tackle going through. Um, about 30 years ago, I learned from a planner, a brilliant planner, um, who said, what is urban? Urban is any place you can walk to a bar. <laughs> As a son of a tavern owner, I could relate to that. <laughs> going through. I th that works. Cool. Um, yeah, we just have a few more minutes left. Um, so I wanted to give you all the opportunity to say what excites you most about cities right now or urban innovation right now. Like, one quick thing I will say... I actually think it is the shift of focuses, uh, a focus not just from big cities like the New Yorks, which are anomalies in the States, um, or is an anomaly in the States, but uh, sort of the local revitalization of hyper-localized, like human-driven revitalization of what some people might call secondary cities in the US. I think that's very exciting. Uh, what excites me are the younger people that are going to cities and staying in cities. And I think you are going to be the test as we go through. Uh, I just, as I was uh, coming up the street, I saw a wonderful couple with a baby strapped to the gentleman's you know, chest going through. Mm -hmm. Where will they be in 10 years? 20 or 30 years ago, they came out to the suburbs. If they stay in the cities, it's transformative. And I think all of us are paying it very careful attention. So all of you are our test in that. I think for me, the excitement is the uncertainty of it all. I mean, we'd have some trends, but what will it actually look like? What will the experience be? I mean, the kind of awesome side, the optimistic side is that, you know, we have a, you know, livable, enjoyable city with, you know, quirks that, you know, New Orleans will still, you know, be 30 years behind everyone else in kind of like, you know, efficiency, quote unquote, but that's its charm, you know? The Paris Metro will still not work. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, but the hope is that we find these kind of awesome quirks and, you know, it, not to say that we turn back to the city state, but that we become kind of in this world of multiple voices, of multiple communities. The scary side is, is that uh, pick whatever brand and it's everywhere. I mean, in some places you can go downtown London, downtown Tokyo, Beijing, Shanghai, and you have no idea what city you're in. You know, I actually had a moment of dislocation in Paris where it's just like, Wait a minute, am I in D.C.? Like, what's going on? Because, like, you, you know, and the worry is the homogenization, which I think we talked about, you know, the monoculture. So I think it's, like, an interesting, grand experiment that is happening organically, you know, with, like, a lot of ideas bubbling up, you know. So it will be fun to see what happens. You know, it's our next kind of big urban, you know, cycle of humanity. Um, I'll say right now what excites me, and this may sound weird, is, um, is people's skepticism. What excites me is being, and this happened in June when I was presenting at the Social Innovation Summit on public housing, and people were like, uh, are you in the right place? Like, what are you doing? Um, I love that because in that is an opportunity to change the narrative of how people are defining cities, how people define citizens of cities, and how people um, are, for, not well, forcing is a little strong, but getting people to have uncomfortable conversations that will, it, that will result in innovations that work for poor people and being inclusive in that conversation. So what excites me is the possibility, I'm an eternal optimist, um, but we can make public housing work and work better. And the skepticism I love, because that's a complete door to kick down and open up and think about how we can do this. Um, 
I, I want to say two things. One is um, sort of the strong belief in creative thought um, and that we live in a time where creative minds are, uh, have the ability to change the world versus, let's say, um, a mechanistic mind or a mind only focused on making existing systems more efficient. Um, and the other thing is a project example, um, uh, which is one of those global game changers that comes across once in a while. Uh, we got involved with an organization called Global Seawater uh, a few years back. Uh, global Seawater is a concept around a group of scientists at the University of Arizona to develop um, what in a simple term is a biofuel farm. It's a halophyte called salicornia that is a plant that grows in the desert, in coastal desert lands. Uh, can be irrigated with uh, unfiltered ocean water. Um, but uh, what they did was they built a um, kind of man-made eco um, ecological system around this idea of salicornia um, that starts with aquacultures and go uh, goes through seawater canals and um, uh, a mangrove forests that live in uh, symbiosis with salicornia and create um, these big farms that um, we did a plan uh, by the Red Sea in Egypt for that, that create uh, thousands of jobs in places where there's nothing right now because it's ocean and it's sea, it's, it's desert. Um, they create thriving um, ecological environments and they create small cities that are needed to run, or with people that, that they're needed to run those farms. And it's a concept that's so future oriented and so surprising um, uh, that, uh, you know, those are the things that I think we should not forget, that uh, ingenuity puts together ideas that create new places that we can't even dream of today. Cool. Thank you. We'll leave with that and uh, go vote, everybody, this year. All right. Thanks a lot.